When Margaret Barnes, 71, a retired factory worker from Birmingham, decided to have a weekend break away, she could not have foreseen that it would be her last trip away. Margaret was visiting Barmouth, Gwynard, and on the 10th of July 2022, she'd been out socialising and drinking with friends. Arrangements had been made with a local B&B for Margaret to stay in Barmouth. Before attempting to find her B&B, Margaret had purchased a bottle of gin while on a seaside stroll in the evening, after which she made her way to Marine Parade, where she entered a property she believed to be her accommodation for the night. Margaret had in actual fact not entered her B&B, but instead she entered the home of David Redfern, which she found unlocked. This was a mistake which would ultimately cost her her life. Margaret made herself comfortable in Redfern's home, getting into bed at around 10 past 10 p.m. 40 minutes later, Redfern and his partner, Nicole Learoyd Lewis, went upstairs to go to bed. When they opened the door to their bedroom, they found Margaret sitting up in bed drinking gin and tonic, with her false teeth on the bedside table. Redfern, at first, calmly called the police and asked officers to come to remove Margaret from the premises. Redfern, however, didn't wait for the police to arrive. Instead, Redfern, 45, who weighed 21 stones, decided to move Margaret, who weighed just 7.5 stones, himself. Redfern dragged Margaret down the stairs and threw her out of the house. He said that he had been petrified and scared to find Margaret in his bed. He claimed that Margaret was aggressive and paralytically drunk. As Margaret lay on the ground outside the house, Redfern stamped on the frail old lady's body, laughing at her as she cried out in pain. A neighbour heard shouting and found Margaret lying in the street. She said Redfern sounded like a raving lunatic. He told her not to touch Margaret. Zelena Hart, the owner of a nearby hotel, stopped her car when she saw what was happening. She asked Margaret whether she was in pain, and Margaret told her, Yes, my chest hurts. I've been beaten up. Redfern watched as Margaret crouched on the ground, trying to gather together her possessions, and he refused to call an ambulance when asked to do so by a neighbour. When Redfern kicked and stamped on Margaret, he caused major liver damage and broke several of her ribs. Redfern's partner, Nicola Leroyd Lewis, told him, you could have just escorted her out. It's an old lady. Redfern declared that there was nothing wrong with her. All I've done is eject her from my house. Redfern brought Margaret water, cushions and took her pulse. But as her condition worsened, people at the scene attempted to perform CPR. Leroy Lewis had begged Margaret, please don't die, please don't die. But later she said, it's too late. Margaret was heard to say, I'm sorry. Margaret died at the scene from severe blunt force trauma, with injuries consistent with a high-speed road traffic collision. Redfern would later ask detectives, how would you react to someone breaking into your house and sitting in your bed? He denied murder and manslaughter, claiming that Margaret had been aggressive and angry towards his partner and he had behaved passively. He said that Margaret had claimed his fiancée had stolen her handbag, which was later found in her suitcase. He said he made a footballer's sideways block to stop the 71-year-old from lunging at Leroy Lewis as he wished to protect her because she was still recovering from concussion after falling off a linen basket months earlier. He told police in an interview, I travelled that distance as quickly as humanly possible in response to Margaret's act. I don't know if my foot got caught, whether I hit Margaret with my foot or my knee. I ended up spinning over the top of Margaret almost hitting a white car that was there. Redfern admitted that he could be verbally abusive and that he was seeing a psychotherapist. He claimed that he merely ushered Margaret outside with a bear hug. But police body cam footage from PC Annie Britton, who attended the scene, showed Redfern saying, I threw her out of the bedroom, dragged her down the stairs by her ankles, and threw her out of the door. You do not expect to find someone else in your bed. I just wanted to get this strange woman out of the house. At Redfern's court case, Judge Bourne said, You're a large and strong man, age 45 at the time. She was small and slight, at least 25 years older than you, and clearly affected by alcohol and unsteady on her feet. 
Detective Superintendent Mark Pierce of North Wales, said Redfern had shown no remorse during his two-week trial. He said he had tried to blame Mrs Barnes and subjected her family to the trauma of a court case. Pierce said, Redfern is a cowardly, vicious bully. Redfern was found guilty and given a life sentence at Carnarvon Crown Court and will serve a minimum of 14 years in prison. Convicted of the murder of Margaret Barnes. The circumstances of the case were very unusual. For a few days in early July 2022, Mrs Barnes was visiting Barmouth. She came there alone, although it seems that she saw some friends or acquaintances during her visit. In the course of Sunday the 10th of July 2022, she was thinking about where to stay that night. It seems that someone made an arrangement for her to stay at the Wavecrest B&B, a few doors away from your house in Marine Parade. We know that in the late afternoon and early evening, she was walking in Barmouth. She bought some food and drink. The evidence suggests that she was significantly under the influence of alcohol. At 10 past 10 p.m. she approached your house. The only suggested explanation for this is that she mistook your house for the B&B where she had a booking. The door was unlocked and she went in. It seems that meeting nobody in the front hall, she went upstairs and installed herself in what was in fact your bedroom. At that time you and your partner were in another room in the house watching television. In the course of the day, you'd had quite a substantial amount to drink. At about 10.45pm, you and your partner decided to go to bed. You found your bedroom locked from the inside. You got a spare key, and when the two of you entered the room, you were astonished to find Mrs Barnes in the bed, holding a drink in her hand, possessions scattered around with a smell of cigarette smoke. It seemed to you that she had tampered with some of your possessions too. Your first reaction was entirely appropriate. You asked her what she was doing in your home. You've said that her replies were contradictory or confused. At 10.52pm, you telephoned the police, told them calmly about the situation, and asked them to send someone to remove Mrs Barnes. But after that, things went terribly wrong. You rejoined your partner and Mrs Barnes in the bedroom. There was some sort of confrontation. When told that the police had been called, you've said that Mrs Barnes responded aggressively and she accused your partner of stealing her handbag and lunged towards her. It seems that this was the trigger for what happened next. The jury has found that you assaulted Mrs Barnes with a kick or a stamp. That kick or stamp must have been inflicted with considerable force. The evidence of a pathologist told us that Mrs Barnes sustained a catastrophic injury, including three broken ribs and an injury to her liver, which in the opinion of the pathologist, was unsurvivable. That's the crime of which you've been convicted. Immediately afterwards, you dragged Mrs Barnes by her ankles down the stairs to the ground floor. You then flung her wheeled suitcase out into the front yard. Your partner then led Mrs Barnes outside, supporting her by her arm. We've seen that on CCTV. It's clear that your partner acted gently and carefully in her contact with this 71-year-old lady who at that time was unsteady on her feet. You then came outside and your behaviour towards Mrs Barnes was aggressive and offensive. You sat on an outside chair and watched her in an aggressive or threatening attitude while she crouched on the ground trying to gather her possessions together. Within her earshot as she crouched or lay on the ground, you accused her of stealing and delivering I'm glad to say that in your evidence to the court, you acknowledged that appalling behaviour and apologised for it. Over the next couple of hours, Mrs Barnes remained on the ground outside your house and her condition deteriorated. The police did not attend because they'd been diverted to a firearms incident nearby. No ambulance was able to attend until it was too late, though as I've said, medical treatment would not have saved her. During that time, you remained present, as did some of the neighbours, and for much of the time, your partner. Your partner and two of the neighbours in particular behaved appropriately. They could see Mrs Barnes was in trouble. They stayed by her, tended her as best they could, and tried to summon assistance. At least she received compassionate care from them during her last hours. Your behaviour, however, remained inappropriate and insulting. 
When a neighbour asked you to call an ambulance, you refused, so the neighbour called the ambulance herself. You did bring some cushions for Mrs Barnes and a drink of water, and on one occasion take her pulse when asked to do so, and I've not overlooked those matters of detail. By about 1am, Mrs Barnes was being given CPR by a neighbour. At about 2am, after emergency services had arrived, she was declared dead. The jury has found that she was killed by the kick or stamp which you delivered, with the intention of doing her really serious physical harm. Now I accept that you must have been very shocked to find a stranger in your house, in your bedroom. I also work on the assumption that she behaved aggressively towards your partner, accusing her of stealing and lunging towards her. But your reaction surpassed anything that any reasonable person could imagine. You're a large and strong man, aged 45 at the time. She was small and slight, at least 25 years older than you, and clearly affected by alcohol and unsteady on her feet. I can understand why you might have escorted her out of your house, though a different person might have responded to the situation by trying to help her. But the assault, a kick or stamp of sufficient force to cause a fatal injury, was a dreadful thing to do to a defenceless elderly person. We've heard moving victim impact statements from members of Mrs Barnes's family for whom her loss has been devastating. She was a much-loved wife, mother and grandmother. By statute, the sentence for murder is life imprisonment. My task is to determine the minimum term which you must serve before you can be considered for release. Then determining the minimum term, I must take into account the seriousness of the offence and must give credit for any periods of remand in custody. I have to have regard to the principles set out in Schedule 21 to the Sentencing Act 2020. Applying those principles, this is not the sort of wholly exceptional case which attracts a whole life term under paragraph 2, nor is it in the categories which attract minimum terms of 25 or 30 years under paragraphs 3 and 4. That being so, paragraph 5 provides that for an adult offender, the appropriate starting point for the minimum term is 15 years. I'm then required to take into account any aggravating or mitigating factors which have not already been considered in my choice of starting point. Schedule 21 provides non-exhaustive lists of factors which may be relevant. In this case, two statutory aggravating factors were present. First, the fact that the victim was particularly vulnerable because of age or disability. As I've said, Margaret Barnes was a frail and elderly lady affected by intoxication. Second, mental or physical suffering inflicted on the victim before death. As I've said, you forcefully dragged her down the stairs and then outside the house you engaged in the insulting and taunting behaviour that I've described. Those matters did not contribute to her death, but they make the case more serious. There were also other aggravating factors not specified in the legislation, such as refusing to call an ambulance, though the only effect of that was that it was called by a neighbour instead, the use of a shod foot as a weapon, and committing the offence under the influence of alcohol, although I do not find that alcohol was a significant factor. Also present were two statutory mitigating factors. First, I find that in this case your intention was to cause really serious bodily harm rather than to kill. Second, a lack of premeditation. Your encounter with Mrs Barnes was, as I've made clear, utterly unexpected. It seems clear that the confrontation between her and you and your partner and your assault on her happened suddenly. There are some other mitigating factors as well. Third, the fact that this crime followed hard upon the shock of finding a stranger in your home, and this was at a time when you were under personal stress as a result of a medical condition which had caused your driving licence to be removed or suspended, causing isolation and difficulties for you. Fourth, the fact that the fatal assault consisted only of a single blow. Finally, it's important to note that until that day last July, you were of good character, with no convictions, cautions or reprimands recorded against you having reached the age of 46. I have read numerous character references which show that you have been a hard-working and community-minded person, with many people having experienced kindness and generosity from you. 
Your council has put forward uh, some other factors for my consideration, but these have not made a material difference. I do not accept your good character extended to what the courts sometimes call exemplary conduct. The impact of this case on your family must be considerable, but that is an almost inevitable consequence of an offence of this kind. Your positive attitude to custody is to your credit, but is not so unusual as to affect the minimum term. And I'm not in a position to judge that the risk which you may pose in the future is necessarily particularly low, as Council has suggested. And nor can I interpret any of your remarks made at the scene as an acceptance of culpability which could make a significant difference to sentence, bearing in mind your not guilty plea to the charges that you faced. The aggravating factors on the one hand and the mitigating factors on the other both carry significant weight. They're close to cancelling each other out. Nevertheless, I attach particular weight to the lack of intention to kill and to the sudden and bizarre circumstances in which your unpremeditated offence was committed. Those things do not begin to excuse what you did. They do, however, differentiate this case from many others to which the same 15-year starting point would apply. The net effect is that I will make a small downward adjustment to the minimum term to 14 years. Can you stand up, please, Mr. Redfern? The sentence for murder is life imprisonment. The minimum term will be 14 years. The time which you've spent on remand, 238 days, will be deducted from the time you must now serve, making a net minimum term of 13 years and 127 days. If that figure is wrong for any reason, it can be corrected administratively. It's important that you and everyone involved with this case should understand what this means. The minimum term is not a fixed term after which you'll be automatically released. It's the minimum time you'll spend in custody in full before your case can be considered by the parole board. It will be for them to say whether and if so on what conditions you're to be released. If and when you are released, you'll be subject to license for the rest of your life. If you were to breach any condition of a license, the license could be revoked and you would be recalled to prison. And if the surcharge applies, an order will be drawn up accordingly. That concludes my sentence. The Barnes family said, It has been the hardest time of our lives. It has been especially difficult for Margaret's husband, who had been her partner for 56 years. We now have some sort of closure on what has happened. However, no length of sentence will ever fill the void that Margaret has left behind. Margaret's daughter, Natalie, said, Every morning we wake up struggling to cope with the fact that we will never see her again. My dad and my brother can't come to terms with the fact that mum called out for them as she was dying, but they were unable to help her. It has literally destroyed our family. We no longer talk about anything other than mum's death. It is no longer enjoyable to see each other. Dad has completely withdrawn from family life. Mum didn't need to die. We don't understand why she had to. Robin Barnes, Margaret's granddaughter, fought back tears as she read her victim impact statement. My grandmother was taken from us in a way we never imagined, she said. We struggled to think how she suffered in the last few moments of her life. There's an empty seat at our table at Christmas and for birthdays. She will never be there for the milestones in my life. She will never see me get married. She will never be able to meet my children. We miss her every day. We will miss her forever. We are completely heartbroken.